Welcome to Using Direct Communication to Discuss Difficult Topics, a webinar for VISTA leaders. By virtue of their role on the team, VISTA leaders are likely to encounter a conflict or an issue that needs to be addressed. This webinar offers five strategies for direct communication that can help navigate difficult topics. I'm your host, Andy King, Senior Training Specialist with AmeriCorps VISTA. I'm pleased to introduce you to our presenter, Lisa Reitmeyer. Lisa is a writer and educator who partners with different nonprofits in and around Portland, Oregon, as a trainer, consultant, and writer. Lisa is both a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Burkina Faso and an alumna of the AmeriCorps National Program affiliated with Teachers College, Columbia University where she graduated with her master's in education. Lisa, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Andy. I'm really glad to be here to talk with the VISTA leaders about the confidence one needs to enter into difficult conversations. Difficult conversations can be ones we tend to avoid, but when we have the skills we need, we can confidently move toward the conflict knowing that all relationships, even healthy relationships, have conflict. Let's take a look at what I hope we'll get out of our time together. The first outcome is about defining what makes a conversation difficult. Next, I want to leave you all with five strategies that you can take from this presentation and start using in your conversations with colleagues, family, and friends that can turn in a difficult conversation into its more mature friend, the direct conversation. Finally, I want all of us to listen to what a direct conversation that uses these five strategies we learned today sounds like. You'll gain insights from these examples to help you to be able to apply them to real life situations in your leader role. Think of a difficult conversation you've had in the past. What made it challenging? What was it like before, during, and after the conversation? What emotions, if any, were involved? If you feel comfortable sharing in the chat, I'll read some of the responses aloud. And if you don't have the chat window open, um, you can use the button that's there at the bottom of the screen to open up the chat panel. Um, and be sure you send your message to everyone so that your colleagues will see your contributions. All right, so Olivia, um, you mentioned talking about uh, VISTA members' poor performance recently is a difficult conversation that's happened. Yeah, talking about poor performance should be. Um, let's see, Marcus mentions stress throughout the process uh, of a conversation. I'm, I'm guessing that's what makes it challenging, right? Is the stress involved? Um, uh, Robert mentioned uh, communicating or, or having conversation with a veteran who had anger control issues. Um, let's see, John mentioned the intimidating presence uh, of someone that you're encountering. Yeah, so it's the that in the moment, uh, intimidation and stress. Uh, oh, and William talks about um, talking with one teammate who makes another teammate uncomfortable. So having to raise that issue with them, um, sort of being in the middle of it a bit. Uh, oh, Molly talked about uh, one of the things that makes it challenging is um, a lack of taking in or understanding what the other person is actually saying. So maybe um, talking past one another. Um, let's see, trying to manage your own emotions during a conversation can be a challenge. Um, staying on topic and not being distracted. And let's see, lots of other ideas here. A few repeating themes here or common themes that, that are coming up again and again. Um, a couple here about accountability and, and following up with people who were supposed to have done something. Um, and then the sort of the personal side of things, um, unhappiness or struggles with their role. So a lot of, a lot of ideas there. Um, Lisa, what stood out for you? Well, I, I, a part that stood out to me was this idea of the 
stress around the conversation itself and then the actual stress of the of the conversation itself is sort of two things that can heighten emotions very quickly and fear is a big reason difficult conversations feel difficult. We often, that fear and stress, we often avoid difficult conversations altogether because of this fear and stress. But the strategies we'll talk about today will help build your confidence to enter into these conversations. And um, since each of us might have a different definition of what makes a difficult conversation difficult, let's get on the same page. And we'll do that by looking at what makes a conversation difficult. So Seth Godin is a writer and teacher I admire. He defines difficult conversations as conversations that occur when we want more than one thing. So we want someone to stop doing something and not be mad at us, for example. Or we want a person to change their behavior and still be our friend. Or we want someone to change their output but continue to like and respect us. If we have authority over someone and we don't care what that person thinks of us, we don't consider it difficult. Think a TSA agent telling us to stand in a different line at the airport. They have the authority to tell us to do that and they don't care if we like them. But if either you don't have the authority or you care what the other person thinks, then it can become a difficult conversation. If we must discuss difficult topics, the conversation must be direct. So how do we move from having difficult conversations to having direct conversations? Let's go over some strategies. So Seth Godin's blog post entitled Difficult Conversations at Work is a good place to start. It's not very long, so I'll go ahead and read it out loud. You'll see some important phrases pop up on the slide as I read. When the outcome of a conversation is in doubt, Godin says, don't do it by email and show up in person if you can. The synchronicity of face-to-face -face conversation gives you the chance to change your tone in midstream. Be curious, ask questions. A great question is usually better than a good answer. And don't forget, the value of a long pause is difficult to overstate. And there you have it, our first four strategies when it comes to direct communication. Do not have the conversation via email, instead have the conversation face-to-face. Consider your tone of voice, be curious by asking questions, and embrace the long pause. So let's look at these a bit more in depth. These days, Zoom counts as face-to-face, -face, right? It's not ideal, but it's still better than the telephone alone and certainly better than email or text message. Face-to-face -face interactions help us adjust to our, our conversation with our voice and body language. Looking people in the eye is important, and an online video conference tool makes that possible. It also signals that the topic is serious and deserving of everyone's time. The small talk that typically begins a face-to-face -face interaction is also an opportunity to make a genuine connection beforehand. When I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Burkina Faso, every conversation, casual or formal, opened with a series of questions. How are you? How is your family? How is your health? How is your family's health? And these were not merely conversational bridges. They were sincere inquiries into a person's well being, and they taught me something valuable about human interaction. People have a lot going on in their lives, and whatever top topic you've got in mind might not be the most important or pressing issue to them. So it's important to keep things in perspective. Sincerely reaching out can go a long way because it can put people at ease and make a connection on a personal level. How was your weekend? or even less personal question about the weather or current events where the person is located work too. These interactions are typical in person, less common over the telephone and nearly impossible with email. Do not underestimate them. Human decency and connection go a long way. Most of us don't like conflict, but conflict is normal, healthy and handled well, it's an opportunity. One of the worst things we can do with conflict is to pretend it's not there. In direct conversations, a person moves right toward the conflict. Being curious helps us learn more about the conflict in order to be able to come to a reasonable solution. The best way to be curious is to ask open-ended questions and then wait for a response. A phrase like, really? How so? is an example of how you can bring your curiosity to the table. Tell me more and how can I help also work? Chances are, if you enter into conversation thinking you know exactly how it should end, you're not being curious enough. 
you might need to learn something to come up with a solution that will work. Your assumptions might be wrong. Curiosity requires humility and acknowledgement that you might not have it all figured out and that the solution is still negotiable and discoverable. Good leaders are curious and believe that the people on the team bring real knowledge and ideas to the table. Good leaders listen. What are some other questions you could ask in a conversation? And in addition to questions, what are some other ways you can be curious? All right, so for this activity, again, we'll use the chat feature so you can share your ideas. And as they come in again, I'll read out some of them out aloud. The question again is, what are some other questions you could ask in a conversation? Or what are other ways that you can be curious? All right, so we've got a few responses here. Uh, tell me more about that as a way to get somebody to uh, continue on. Uh, asking, what do you want to happen? Or how did that feel for you? Uh, you could ask about what things have gone well lately um, and, and then ask, can we replicate that? Or you could simply state your lack of knowledge um, and ask for help as a way to invite more information. Uh, another possibility, asking, how is your energy level today? Again, that shows some humility and humanity, I would add. Um, or asking, how does that connect to your VAD, your VISTA assignment description? Or here's what I heard, and then repeat back your understanding of what they said, uh, and ask, is that what you meant? Um, or asking what you think about this weather today, all right, so lots of examples of questions there. Um, yeah, so these are good ones that we could add to our list of questions to ask. I agree. There are some great additions to the Be Curious strategy. And before we move on, I want to say one more thing about how we ask questions. It's one thing to know what you want to ask, but equally important is how you ask it. With a question like, really, there's a way to ask it that sounds sarcastic and demeaning, and there's a way to say it with sincerity and openness. So with the right tone, you'll have a better chance of engaging someone in a purposeful conversation. A serious <clears throat> but friendly tone isn't easy to master, but that's the goal. So how do we manage the emotions that might arise, emotions like anger, fear, or frustration during these conversations? There are strategies that might work for some of us, but not all of us. Taking deep breaths, for example. Others use humor to help reduce tension. Others might doodle in a notebook during a conversation. Think about what calms you down. Ask yourself how you prepare for other things in your life that you might dread or be stressed about, like going to the dentist. The strategies you employ in those scenarios can help you consider might work, what might work for you in a difficult conversation. Once during a performance review, I had a boss tell me that he always knew, as did everyone else in the room, when I didn't like an idea pre being presented in a meeting because I rolled my eyes. I didn't know I was rolling my eyes. I couldn't believe it. I rolled my eyes in a work meeting. I felt humiliated. My boss told me that he appreciated knowing what I thought. He just wished I expressed it in another way, using my voice, for example. He wanted to know what I thought, but I had to figure out how to form those initial impressions that caused me to roll my eyes into a useful, productive sentence. Our body language sets a tone, much like the tone of our voice. When our emotions are running high, it's difficult to keep these things in check. If a conversation begins and you feel your voice or your body temperature rise or your heartbeat increase, you can end the conversation. You could say something like, I'm so sorry to do this, but I really need to have this conversation at a different time. Is there a time that might work for you? This is a way to end a conversation in a direct and polite way. Practicing a conversation beforehand in a mirror with a friend can be a great way to help repair practicing your tone and building your confidence. You could consider outlining or writing down what to say first and then practicing it in the mirror, recording yourself talking into the phone just to hear what your tone sounds like and to allow yourself to adjust before the real conversation takes place.
Embracing the long pause is definitely the most difficult for most people at the strategies we've worked talking about so far. A long pause means silence and silence during a conversation can feel awkward. We might feel long pauses can mean that the conversation's not going well. But in direct conversation, the long pause is crucial. It allows the other person to gather their thoughts before responding. If you jump in and fill the silence, it can interrupt their think time and can sometimes cause them to lose confidence and shut down. The goal is to keep quiet, don't panic, and don't rush to rescue them from the awkwardness. How long is too long? This is where your intuition comes in. If you're thinking that the pause has gone on for longer than a minute and you're pretty sure the other person will not speak, then it might be time to use another one of the strategies we've already discussed like curiosity. Ask a question, then wait again. It's possible though not likely that using a combination of questions and long pauses will not get the other person to talk. If a conversation feels stalled, you could suggest having the conversation at a different time. Don't give up on having the conversation, but it's not a conversation if only one person is talking. So set a different time on a different day and that might be the answer. Another unfortunate but common reaction to a direct line of questioning is defensiveness. My boss tells me I roll my eyes during meetings and I respond with, no, I don't. Defenses fly up and their conversation enders, aren't they? Your best reaction to initial defensiveness is a combination of the long pause and curiosity. The defensiveness might fade when they realize you're willing to listen. Defensiveness might be their initial, but not their final reaction. Give it time, try to stick with them. If they don't talk, you can simply state the phrase again. I notice that you roll your eyes during meetings and I'm wondering if there's something I can do to help empower you to speak up instead when you disagree with an idea or comment. Depending on how defensive the other person becomes, this might be a reason to end the conversation and come up with another approach because it's nearly impossible to have a conversation with someone who is defensive. Again, you can't control what the other person does and says, so focus on your own words and actions. When a person is unwilling to participate in the conversation, you can suggest having the conversation at a different time. You can offer to invite other colleagues whom the member knows and respects to join the conversation. If those don't work, then you'll likely need to follow the procedures set by your organization. This might mean bringing the member site supervisor into the conversation or involving the sponsoring organization. This is what can happen when direct conversations fail and it's not always our fault when they do, but the strategies we're covering today can help ensure that they do work. Joy Baldridge is a writer and speaker who calls the five words best used in difficult conversations, velvet hammers. These are words that are soft like velvet, but pack a punch to get results. The velvet hammers are the fifth strategy we'll talk about today to help you have a direct conversation. What are the velvet hammers? They are noticed and wondering, really, and likelihood and when. These are the five words you can write down on a sticky note and put right above your workstation. They're direct, respectful, and they get the job done. The first two, noticed and wondering, are a great way to start a direct conversation. I notice that you're often late in the mornings and I'm wondering if there's something I can do to help. Or, I notice that you often roll your eyes during meetings and I'm wondering if there's a way I can help you feel more empowered to speak up. Then you wait for a response. You might have to wait a while. Remember to embrace the long pause. Really, and other questions are great tools for the middle of the conversation. We've talked about how to maintain a friendly tone because we're genuinely curious about their responses. The responses to those questions might take the conversation places we did not expect to go. Maintain flexibility, openness, and curiosity. Be prepared to learn something new. Then to end the conversation, likelihood and when, get to the heart of the issue and allow for the other person to have agency while still being held responsible. They set the expectation. What's the likelihood you'll begin arriving on time starting tomorrow? Or what's the likelihood you'll be able to speak or share your thoughts during the discussion in our next meeting? The when is important because it sets up a timeline wherein you'll know if the direct conversation worked or not. Let's look at a few examples of direct conversations while thinking specifically about your role as a VISTA leader by using some case studies I made up. The characters will be played by Andy King and Bethany Dusablin. Sonia is an imaginary VISTA leader who's about to find herself faced with a difficult conversation. Sonia supports eight VISTA members across the state of Washington. Aiden, one of the members Sonia supports, has trouble remembering to submit his reports on time. 
Sonia is hoping a direct conversation will help resolve the issue. Aiden serves at a nearby nonprofit, so Sonia requests a face-to-face -face meeting. They meet, and Sonia starts by asking Aiden about his weekend. She learns that Aiden went camping and hiking. Next, Sonia moves right toward the conflict and uses two of the velvet hammers right away. Let's listen in on their conversation. Hey, Aiden. I've noticed that your reports have come in late three months in a row now, and I was wondering if there was a way I could help you figure out a strategy to get them to me on time. Here's how Aiden responded to Sonia's noticing and wondering. Silence. Either he's caught off guard by the direct line, or he's considering how to respond, or both. And here's Sonia's response to Aiden's silence. Sonia embraces the long pause, even though it feels awkward and uncomfortable. She's allowing time for Aiden to formulate a response to the direct line. How long does Sonia wait? Maybe a full minute, maybe longer. Maybe Sonia is writing long pause over and over in a notebook to help remind herself the importance of waiting for the response. Sonia must use her intuition to figure out whether to wait even longer or ask another question. Finally, Aiden talks. I hate that stuff. I mean, what's the point anyway? Does anyone actually read those things? They do. The reports help support the program locally and nationally but I know they're not the most exciting things to fill out. What do you hate about filling out the reports? Here, Sonia uses curiosity while maintaining a sincere and friendly tone. Sonia also listens to Aiden's concerns that the work is pointless and responds by validating them and explaining. She then adds a question, what do you hate about the work you're supposed to do? This is a chance for Sonia to find out if there are other obstacles. Maybe Aiden doesn't understand how to fill out the reports. Maybe he forgets to, to do them and just needs additional reminders. Or maybe Aiden is avoiding them because of his presumption that the reports are useless. I don't know, Sonia. Here again, Sonia will embrace the long pause until Aiden continues. Uh, it feels like busy work. I completely understand. I too have to submit reports on my end, so I get it. Here, Sonia demonstrates some empathy. She knows what it's like to do something that isn't exciting and takes a lot of time. Empathy deepens human connection. How will Aiden respond to that empathy? I guess I didn't realize it was so serious. He's admitting that he feels a little stressed about this conversation. He's worried he's in trouble. He wants Sonia to like him, but he also hates filling out the reports. Really? Here, Sonia uses another velvet hammer while maintaining her serious but friendly tone. Yeah, I mean, you set up this whole meeting just to talk about the reports? I thought I did something bad. The bidding reports is part of your responsibility as a VISTA member, so it's serious. What's the likelihood you'll be able to submit next month's report on time? Here, Sonia reiterates the expectation and reminds Aiden that filling out the reports is part of their work. She also uses the final two velvet hammers, likelihood and when, to conclude the conversation and move from discussion to solution. Yeah, I can do that. And now we have an agreement to the solution. Sonia concludes the conversation by saying that she looks forward to seeing Aiden's report on the 15th of the following month and thanking Aiden for the meeting. Now there is a better chance Aiden will submit his reports on time. But if he doesn't, he won't be surprised if the issue escalates. This example obviously went really well. Uh, what did Sonia do that helped the conversation go so well? Type in your response to the chat and we'll read some of them aloud. All right, again, if you will kindly use the chat to share your thoughts on what it is that Sonia did to help this conversation go well. All right, so uh, a number of you said she showed empathy and patience, understanding. Uh, she used that long pause as well as a curiosity. Uh, and she emphasized and let Aiden know that uh, she also has to submit the report. So sort of creating that bond there. 
Yep, she used kindness. She was uh, relating to his frustration, tried to put herself in his shoes, right? Using that empathy and kindness. Great. A lot of great ideas there, and uh, a number of you have mentioned some of the same things. Uh, Lisa, what do you think? Yeah, in a nutshell, Sonia used all five of the strategies we talked about, and it was likely the combination, all of them, that helped make the conversation a success. She stated the problem, that reports were coming in late, and asked if there was something she could do to help them get them in on time. She used a long pause to give Aiden time to respond. She was open to hearing if there were other issues related to getting to the reports in on time. She responded to Aiden's concerns about the reports being tedious and not mattering. And she made sure Aiden understood his responsibility to submit the reports and remind him when they were due. Great, let's look at two more examples, ones that maybe don't go as well as the conversation between Sonia and Aiden. As you listen to this next conversation between Alex and Audrey, look for evidence of the five strategies we've discussed today. Face-to-face -face interactions, being curious, considering our tone, embracing the long pause, and using the velvet hammers. We'll also post a copy of the entire conversation in the chat so you have it for reference if you'd like to follow along while it's being read, read aloud by our fabulous actors. After we listen to the conversation, we're gonna do a waterfall chat, but I'll explain that what that is when we come back together. After lunch one busy day, Alex receives an email from a VISTA member asking to set up a Zoom call with her that afternoon. Alex writes back right away and accepts the invitation to the Zoom. When the Zoom call begins, Alex notices that Audrey, the VISTA member, looks nervous. Hey, Alex. Thanks for meeting with me. Of course. Uh, I've noticed that you don't typically call on me during me to talk during our monthly Zoom meetings with the other members, and I was wondering if there was a specific reason or something I should know about why that might be. Whoa, whoa, uh, what now? I mean, uh, what are you talking about? I've noticed that I often raise my hand or type something in the chat during our Zoom calls, but you don't typically call on me, and I feel like I don't get to share as often as I like. I, I was wondering if there's a reason. Uh, a reason why I don't call on you? I guess, yeah. Like, I'd really love to participate more often in calls. I noticed that you often call on Mike and James and Brian. I mean, uh, it's not exactly easy to manage those calls. I can't keep track of who's talking when and then lead the session on top of that. I hope you're not suggesting that I call on others because they're male and you're a female. Uh, I definitely remember calling on you before, several times. Okay, okay, I get it. You're just hoping I can call on you. Is that it? That would be great. Do you think it's likely you'll call on me during the Zoom meeting next month? Yeah, sure, Audrey. Uh, sure thing. I mean, I have called on you before. But yeah, of course. Next month, I'll make sure you get a chance to talk to the whole group. Thanks so much, Alex. Sorry if this was a difficult or awkward conversation. I really like working together and I can't wait for our next meetup. I hope I don't ask for the microphone and then say something totally dumb or pointless. <laughs> no way, no way. You always have such great insights. Okay, thanks again, Alex. And thanks for being such a great team lead, the leader of our team. And that was the end of their Zoom call. Let's talk about the waterfall chat. We're gonna use the chat to share our thinking, but here's the catch. We're going to do it all at once. You'll have 90 seconds to think and respond to the first prompt. 
You'll type your response into the chat, but don't hit enter. After 90 seconds, I'll count you down from three and we'll all hit enter at the same time. The first question is what went well in this conversation? The 90 seconds starts now. So type in your response, but don't hit enter until I give you the signal. Three, two, one. All right, so uh, lots of responses here as uh, we might have expected. Um, let me see if I can do this right. So, uh, right, so the, the VISTA, uh, Audrey, she communicated her needs. Um, he showed some optimism in uh, allowing her to share. Uh, she was direct yet respectful, letting the, the leader know the issue she was having. Uh, there was patience exhibited. Uh, the member was patiently waiting and not getting frustrated. Uh, the commitment to pausing. Yeah, so, uh, so Audrey did a great job there. Um, in the end, it produced a result. And Alex agreed to do what Audrey had wanted, and he understood her. Yeah, when she stated her issue, uh, Alex was caught off guard by it. Uh, but it did, it came, came to resolution, right? After uh, Alex could kind of reflect on his actions, um, she used the long pause well and was clear without getting defensive. All right, so a lot of a lot of great responses there. Uh, they identified a, a good number of things that uh, that Alex did well, but also Audrey in there. Yes, absolutely. Um, Audrey used the velvet hammers as well as the long pause and asked for the Zoom meeting, right? Instead of an email, instead of communicating her concerns via email, she hopped on on the call and did it face-to-face, -face, which was likely a lot more stressful for her and stress-inducing, but it helped communicate the seriousness. And then she really just stuck with him as he kind of went through the motions of initially being very defensive and then kind of coming back around to, okay, so you just want me to call on you, which is ultimately what the what she was asking, right? But he had to kind of work through some stuff before he got there. And she allowed him time to do that. Great, let's do this again for the second prompt. What might Alex consider doing differently next time? So you've got 90 seconds to respond. Remember that um, the handout has the, has the conversation in it if you need to refer back. Uh, so you have 90 seconds to respond, but don't hit enter until I do the countdown.
in three, two, one. Okay, submit your response. All right, so in terms of uh, what might Alex consider doing differently next time, uh, lots of ideas here. Um, let's see, uh, use deep listening, maybe learn about different levels of listening, um, be less defensive, given the tone and the nature of the conversation. Um, yeah, instead of being defensive, be supportive, um, sort of try to turn that around. Uh, yeah, using a pause, he could use a pause himself. Um, uh, take a, a second to manage his own uh, emotions before continuing. Let's see, and acknowledge her comments. You know, just uh, mention what she said, sort of reflect that back, and then pause. Uh, and then finally, he could ask back what uh, what it is that he could do, right? Um, yeah, a number of you mentioned that he could have used the pause or any of the other velvet hammers um, to uh, to sort of get his footing and uh, respond a little more uh, empathetically, um, acknowledging Audrey's concerns, and then being more curious and open to uh, to listen to what she had to say. Um, and to to use some questions to clarify um, wherever that was needed. Great, so uh, a lot of great suggestions here for what Alex could do differently. Absolutely, I'm impressed with the level of insight in your responses. Let's look at another situation in which Alex finds himself in a difficult conversation. Let's listen to the next conversation. A link is posted in the chat in case you'd like to follow along that way. And after we listen to the conversation, we'll do another chat activity. This case involves Maureen, one of, Vista, one of the VISTA members Alex supports. Maureen is located 80 miles from Alex, so they stay connected with phone calls and emails. A few months into the year, Alex begins to notice that while Maureen attends the required calls and trainings, she often circles back to Alex for information that was already distributed to her and the other members. Alex finds that he spends much of his time answering the same questions from Maureen over and over. One morning, frustrated at opening his inbox and seeing five emails from Maureen, Alex decides that his only option is to have a difficult conversation to learn more about the challenges she appears to have with keeping track of important information. Alex decides to pick up the phone and give Maureen a call. Hi, Maureen. It's Alex. Hey, listen, I um. Well, I can't, I mean, I can't keep answering the same questions from you over and over. What questions? I got five emails from you this morning. Yeah, but the first was about... No, no, it's not that. I mean, of course you can come to me with all your questions anytime. I mean, that's why I'm here. I'm here to support you. Maureen, you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, I was just checking in and making sure you're good to go. You've got your calendar and your planner, right? And you've got your notes? Like when we have training, you take notes, right? And you've got that information with you. Do you keep it handy? Sure, yeah. I mean, I attend all those sessions. Great. Okay. Well, uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Maureen. Sure thing, Alex. And with that, Alex hangs up the phone and crosses his fingers that next time Maureen will check her notes before sending him an email. We're going to do another waterfall chat where you type out your responses, but don't submit it until I give the signal. As before, the first question is, what went well in this conversation? You'll have 90 seconds starting now. Type in your response, but don't hit enter until I give you the signal.
Three, two, one. All right. Well, we've got a few responses here. So looks like uh, a number of you are saying uh, not much went well here, right? Alex did state the issue. Um, Mari used some pauses, and that sort of helped Alex find his words to sort of state what the issue was. Um, but uh, yeah, it, uh, in the end, it, it seems a number of you mentioned that it was not all that constructive. Um, uh, although Alex was direct and, and tried to be respectful to Maureen, um, gave her some suggestions around her notes. Uh, and he did uh, reassure her that he's open to questions. Um, but uh, yeah, looks like, uh, yeah, and Maureen uh, seemed to not get defensive. So that was a good thing as well. And um, she seemed willing to discuss it further, even though um, it, the conversation didn't go very much further. So, all right. So a few things there that went well in the conversation. Great. Let's do it again for the, let's do the chat for the second prompt. What might Alex consider doing differently next time? You've got 90 seconds to respond, but don't hit enter until I do the countdown. Three, two, one. All right, so uh, lots of suggestions here. It's gonna take me a second to get back to the top of them. Um, all right, so sounds like uh, some things that Alex could do differently. Uh, he could have addressed the questions um, that Maureen had and as they were going over, uh, answer to those, maybe he could have been more humble, um, you know, maybe explaining, saying that he didn't explain it well enough um, and asking her if she needed some time to perhaps get a pen and paper to be prepared uh, to write down some of the information that he was explaining. Um, Alex could have practiced the conversation. He could have used Zoom instead of a phone call and he could have uh, offered more curiosity. Um, yeah, poor Alex. He needs someone to observe him and let him know um, how he's doing um, by practicing these conversations. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, Alex could have asked more questions. So it's really the the, the strategies that you outlined, the, the curiosity thing. Um, uh, he could have done that better, and then really paused to uh, to give. Marine, more of an opportunity to respond there. Um, and, you know, again, in terms of preparing for the conversation, um, he could have more clearly laid out what his motives and intentions were. Um, seems like it wasn't exactly clear what his issue was, and he wasn't communicating it effectively. And uh, so 
people left the conversation confused. Yes, and also he he wasn't honest, right? Um, he, you know, initially he wanted to have the conversation because he was feeling frustrated, but but I'm not sure that, you know, Maureen picked up on the fact that he was feeling frustrated. So that wasn't communicated. Um, and then she doesn't know why he's feeling, he, he just kept talking and uh, didn't let communicate to her what that he was frustrated. And he's, and he did it over the phone too. Again, you know, when I say that face-to-face -face is one of the strategies, it seems so obvious. And yet these are the kinds of conversations people often avoid having face-to-face -face because they're difficult to have face-to-face. -face. So again, that's a really important strategy because it helps, it just helps the conversation off the right, get off on the right foot. Um, perhaps he wouldn't have talked so much if he could see her looking confused on the screen or, or something like that. But again, having these, the conversations that you want to do via email and on the phone are probably the ones that you should have face-to-face -face the most. So great, great job thinking about what Alex could have done better. Um, next, we want to give you a chance to check your own learning. All right, so as we often do, we wanna pause and give you a chance to see how well you've been following along. Um, we've got uh, some questions. You should see them pop up in, um, in a window on your screen. And if you're on a mobile device, uh, unfortunately this poll feature is not available. So if you would take a moment to review the statements here, each set of statements, and in each group identify the one that is not a direct communication strategy. And once you've made your selection, uh, click the Submit button. Well, it looks like a lot of you have uh, submitted your responses. I'll give you just a couple more seconds. If you haven't yet clicked submit, I would do that now. And then we're going to reveal the, uh, the poll responses here. All right, so uh, I think you should be able to, to see the results here. Um, so for the first the first group, the correct response was D, um, approaching a difficult topic slowly, gradually getting to the point. That's not really direct communication, right? You don't want to beat around the bush. You want to, um, you know, after you establish that human connection, you want to get to the topic and so that it's clear. Uh, and for the second one, uh, the answer was B, uh, reverting to yes, no questions if the other person won't respond. Yeah, yes, no questions, not really conversation starters. So that, again, not a direct communication strategy. So it looks like you all did really well on that second question. The first one was a little bit trickier. Um, but anyway, I really appreciate you participating in this quick activity. And uh, now Lisa has one more reflection for you. Let's think about our own lives now. I bet there's a difficult conversation you know you need to have or you want to have with a supervisor, colleague, friend, or even a family member. Which of these strategies are you going to try? Feel free to enter your responses into the chat whenever. No, we're not gonna do the waterfall chat and I'll read a few aloud.
Using curiosity and the long pause, open-ended questions, no assumptions, keep calm, face-to-face, -face. use the pause, great. And like all things in life, the more we practice having these kinds of direct conversations, the better we will get at having them. So it's okay if they're messy sometimes um, at the beginning when you're first learning, you will get better. Um, and that's important to remember to be kind and generous to ourselves about practicing these strategies. I'll use the I was wondering to start, right? I noticed um, a way that Alex could have started that conversation with Maureen, right? I noticed that I get a lot of emails from you in my inbox and I was wondering if there was a, something we the, you needed to tell me or that we could to discuss, right? Just being honest that his frustration was really about having to respond over and over to her questions, information that he felt she should already know. So yep, noticed and wondering are great ways to just straight, head straight toward the conflict after making that human connection and just diving right in. Deep breaths, aware of the surrounding. Yep, be direct, but lead with questions and listen. Great. Before we go, I want to point out some resources. You can download these from the link that's pasted in the chat. Seth Godin is a teacher, writer, and educator. I really enjoy his daily blog full of creative wisdom and insight. Joy Baldridge is a leadership coach and speaker who coined the Velvet Hammers. Listen to her TED Talk where she talks about the Velvet Hammers plus some other helpful tips for dealing with people in the workplace. And finally, I've included the case studies we looked at today in case you wanna refer back to them or even use them for future trainings of your own. All right, we wanna see what questions you have for Lisa, but before we get to that, um, I'd like to know what you think about this session we have a short evaluation for the webinar. Um, your feedback will be really important, not only for Lisa, but it's helpful for me, uh, as I'm always looking for ways to make these sessions the most useful for you and for other VISTA leaders. Um, the survey is probably already open in your browser window behind Zoom, but if not, the link is pasted there in the chat. And so now it's time to see what questions you might have for Lisa. Anything that came up in our conversation about direct conversations, difficult conversations, the strategies, and the velvet hammers, um, feel free to use the chat uh, for your question, um, and we will get to it. I haven't seen any questions that have come in uh, before. Uh, let's see, well, Colleen asks, will we get a copy of the recording? Yeah, so I'll actually post the recording on the VISTA campus, and once it's up there, I'll uh, email all of you with a, um, uh, a link and instructions for how to, how to view that. We will include with that the, a copy of the slides and the handout, so that um, that will be right there next to the, uh, the recording. Um, and while we're talking about that, I'll just mention that uh, all of our leader webinars uh, are recorded and they're posted there on the campus. Uh, they're organized a little bit differently than they had been in the past. So now they're found in uh, just a few of what we call learning pathways. So we have one about um, the roles of VISTA leaders. Uh, we have uh, an area on supporting your members. And then there's one that's simply called leadership. So you can look in any one of those three. And uh, this topic here on direct communication will be uh, a leadership topic. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions now. Um, if, uh, if one comes in later, we can uh, follow up with you on it. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's ahead next month. Um, our next webinar for leaders is on supporting members through effective check-ins. Uh, we'll have Vivica Brooks with us for that, and that'll be on October 14th. Um, so watch your inbox for an invitation, and we hope to see you there. Uh, 
I really want to thank Lisa Reitmeyer, um, our presenter for today, for such an informative presentation. Thanks, too, for Bethany de Soblin, um, for her instructional design assistance and for portraying some of our characters today. Also, thanks to our production team, Steve Gray, Peter Rivenberg at LSI, and our captioner, Nancy, for all of your support during the presentation. Thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again. This concludes today's presentation.